Ocean acidification, often dramatically called climate change's evil twin, and with a little justification. Now, all the threats to the Great Barrier Reef that we've discussed so far have, in my view, been greatly exaggerated. The effect of increasing temperatures will, if anything, make corals grow faster. Crownothorn starfish plagues are almost certainly totally natural. And the effect of uh, pesticides and sediment from farms is having no effect on the reef. But what about the effect of higher carbon dioxide concentrations on the acidity and or the pH of the ocean. Will this affect some organisms like corals that grow calcium carbonate skeletons? One claim that is often made is that in fact the change in the ocean pH will reduce the growth rate of the uh, corals. Now this whole area of science has exploded in the last couple of decades and I think it's fair to say that the jury is still out on whether it's a, a major problem or not. I'll be showing some data why we should be worried and also other data why there should be a degree of optimism. Please like and subscribe. A coral skeleton is made of calcium carbonate. It gets the calcium from the ions floating around in the seawater. But there are also islands of carbonate and bicarbonate uh, in the water and these come from or, or at least are intricately related to the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. It turns out there's a massive exchange of carbon dioxide between the uh, atmosphere and the ocean, and there's also about roughly 50 times more carbon dissolved in the ocean than there is uh, in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide dissolves to form the bicarbonate and the carbonate ions, but it also, when it does that, liberates hydrogen ions, and this is important because the hydrogen ion concentration determines the pH or the acidity of the ocean. It turns out that a high carbon dioxide concentration will reduce the carbonate concentrations and, incre and increase the hydrogen ion concentration, thus reducing the pH. And this is where the worry comes in. Now on the pH scale, water is neither basic nor acidic. It has a pH of 7. Seawater, on the other hand, is slightly basic, has a pH of a bit over 8. But with the increasing carbon dioxide uh, levels, by the end of the century, this may get down to 7.8 or maybe even 7.6. There is no way that it will ever become uh, acidic. So the term ocean acidification is a, really a little bit of a misnomer. It will never become as bad as that. Actually, Pure rainwater is acidic, quite acidic in fact. It has a pH of around 5.5 due to all the carbon dioxide that's dissolved in it. So even under the worst case scenario, rainwater today will have about 100 times more hydrogen ions than seawater will ultimately have. Rainwater is not exactly a noxious chemical, so we mustn't think of this ocean acidification problem as, you know, somehow it's going to dissolve away the corals. The problem is far more subtle than that, even if it's a problem at all. Now, scientists have done a huge range of experiments, mostly in aquaria, where they'll take a calcifying organism like coral or a crustacean, put it in the aquarium, change the pH or the carbon dioxide level and see what happens. On some occasions, they look at natural places where there's carbon dioxide bubbling out of the seabed. These are volcanic seeps, and they can uh, look what happens to the coral close by. And in rare instances, they might go out onto a reef and dump huge amounts of carbon dioxide onto a still relatively small area of a reef, or change the pH by chucking in a base or an acid to see what happens. And what do they find? Well, if you looked at the scientific literature a decade ago, it was incredibly alarming. Um, all the studies seemed to show coral growth slowed, bivalves dissolving, it was just all bad news. 
But in recent years, there's been a huge number of experiments that actually show very limited or zero effect on corals and other organisms. I'm going to quote from what I think is easily the best summary of literally thousands of experiments that have been done on calcification um, by Jonathan Leung uh, from the University of Adelaide. It is a work actually of monumental proportions. So Leung stated, based on 5,000 observations and about 1,000 studies, many calcifiers, echinoderms, crustaceans, cephalopods, are found to be tolerant to near future ocean acidification. But coccoliths, calcifying algae and corals appear to be sensitive. So there is something to worry about. But he also went on to say that over 70% of the observations in growth and calcifications are non-negative. That means that they were unable to find any major problem happening with the increased carbon dioxide pH. And this implied, he says, the acclimation capacity of many calcifiers uh, to ocean acidification. In other words, there seems to be an ability of organisms to adapt to the changes. So lots of experiments have shown adverse effects, but lots have shown no effect. For corals and for calcification and growth rates, there were more experiments that showed no difference, no adverse effects due to carbon dioxide than showed an effect. But if you crudely added up and averaged all the experiments, you could say that there was a reduction in calcification. But quite frankly, the data is actually all over the place and it's really difficult to know what to think at the moment. For example, one group found uh, almost 40% of the species are sensitive to the end of century carbon dioxide levels. Another group said uh, found a almost 10% decline in coral calcification rates under, albeit extreme, uh, extremely unrealistic actually, carbon dioxide levels. But then there are lots of experiments that show minimal effect or no effect due to the acidification. So Jonathan Leong stated, the pessimistic view that ocean acidification would jeopardize the survival of calcifiers in the near future appears to have become a common belief among marine scientists as it is widely written in textbooks and disseminated in the media. However, this view seems to focus disproportionately on studies showing negative effects, while those showing neutral or positive effects are rarely emphasized. Negative results are also less likely to be published than positive results. And you can understand why. Imagine you're a scientist, you're doing an experiment torturing some coral, and you find, well, it didn't slow down its growth rate. Well, that's a bit of a yawn, nobody's interested. But if you tortured your coral and it slowed down growth rate, wow, the corals of the reef of the whole world are going to slow down this is a really big deal and everybody wants to publish your work. But why are there so many contradicting results? There's probably lots of reasons. Here are just a few. The first is that the pH change is going to take place over about a century. And it's a quite a small change, in fact. And how a coral will react over a small slow change over a century could be very different to if you put your coral in the aquarium and you change the pH very dramatically and quickly. A lot of these challenge experiments will often show a change in the short term, but if you give the organism time to acclimatize, you might show no effect. For example, one experiment on a coral species showed a greatly reduced growth rate to a lower pH after one week, but after six months, the pH of the pH reduction, the, there was actually enhanced calcification of that coral. Now, the second reason that we may get contradicting results is it's actually extremely difficult to do results in the laboratory that are representative of what's going on the reef. In the reef, there are thousands of species, literally, that are interacting. The sunlight is changing, the ocean chemistry is changing, the food availability is changing. And even surprisingly trivial discrepancies between what is natural and what's in your aquarium could make a big difference. For example, one group found that the spacing of the little coral nubbins that they used to do their experiments on 
was very important. If you put the little corals very close together and experimented on them, you'd get maybe a 23% increased growth rate due to a change in carbon dioxide level relative to if you'd space the nubbins further apart. Well, at least one group found that. So it's very, very complicated to do these experiments in a realistic way. Now, the other thing that's often not considered is that on any coral reef, there are naturally very large swings in pH of up to 0.7 pH units between night and day. That's way higher than what's going to happen between now and the end of the century. Now, this happens because of photosynthesis. There's none of that in the night time. So carbon dioxide is released by animals. This lowers the pH. During the day, the carbon dioxide is consumed by the plants and algae and the pH goes up. Many of the experiments don't take into account these nat natural changes. And by the way, the fact that we do already have these large pH changes on reefs tells you that a lot of the organisms must already be quite adapted to largely changing pH levels. The other thing is that we've been talking about the carbon dioxide concentrations and the pH in the water around the coral, but coral lays down its skeleton inside the polyp, right inside the organism. And just like humans, which have the ability to change the pH of our blood, well, corals have the ability to change the pH inside them, especially undoubtedly uh, on the little layer where they're actually forming the calcification, the uh, laying down the calcium carbonate. Now, one of the problems is that we actually don't really understand how these organisms calcify. There are huge gaps in our knowledge. Now, when you have fundamental gaps in your knowledge, you need to be very careful about making predictions, especially doom predictions. And also, especially when the experimental evidence seems to be all over the place. So this might seem to be a colossal mess, but actually it's a fascinating scientific conundrum. I've no idea where it's going to end, but there is certainly no doubt that a lot of the experiments are something which we should be worried about. But there are lots of experiments which gives us cause for optimism. And there are very eminent scientists who are urging that we shouldn't necessarily be merchants of doom. So, for example, uh, Carlos Duarte, a world-leading marine biologist, suggests that we need to supply a degree of organised scepticism to some of these perceived ocean calamities. Amen to that. But I think the wise words of Jonathan Leung are best to end on. The results suggest that the impacts of ocean acidification on calcifiers are less deleterious than initially thought, as their adaptability has been underestimated. Therefore, in the forthcoming era of ocean acidification research, it is advocated that studying how marine organisms persist is as important as studying how they perish, and that future hypotheses and experimental designs are not constrained within the paradigm of negative effects. So it's right to be concerned, but there's also room to be quite optimistic. Well, thanks for watching. If you want more information, they're in the Plato GBR website below. And also, if you have suggestions for topics you want us to cover in the future, put those in the comments. We read all the comments. Thanks very much. <laughs>